He traveled the, the world looking for all of the evidence that he could find with the hopes of poking every hole he could in Christianity to prove that it was false. Having traveled the world, talked to experts, looked at all the evidence that he could find, he said this, quote, I began to realize that I was being intellectually dishonest. My mind told me that the claims of Christianity were indeed true, but my will was being pulled in a different direction. I had placed so much emphasis on finding the truth, but I wasn't willing to follow it once I saw it. For how many is that your story? Or perhaps for how many of you was that your story? But now the Lord has done a mighty work in you. Well, today we want to look at those who have evidence staring them square in the face, and there are those who can see it, and there are those who can't. Go with me, if you will, to John chapter 10. John 10, I'm going to be reading the last portion of John 10, verses 31 to the end of the chapter. Here's, here's what it says. The Jews picked up stones again to stone him. Jesus answered them, I have shown you many good works from the Father. For which of them are you going to stone me? The Jews answered him, It is not for a good work that we're going to stone you, but for blasphemy, because you, being a man, make yourself God. Jesus answered them, Is it not written in your law? I said, You are God's. If he called them gods to whom the word of God came, and scripture cannot be broken, do you say of him whom the Father consecrated and sent into the world, you are blaspheming because I said, I am the Son of God. If I am not doing the works of my Father, then do not believe me. But if I do them, even though you do not believe me, believe the works, so that, uh, that you may know and understand that the Father is in me and I am in the Father. Again, they sought to arrest him, but he escaped from their hands. He went away again and across the Jordan to the place where John had been baptizing at first, and there he remained. And many came to him. And they said, John did no sign, but everything that John said about this man was true. And many believed in him there. That's the reading of the word of the Lord this morning. What is it that we see here? Well, first of all, we see the evidence. Now, before we get into the evidence, what is it that Jesus had done to warrant them picking up stones to stone him? We've seen this now on a few occasions where they're seeking to stone him or to kill him. What has he done? Has he murdered anyone at this point? Has he caused an insurrection against the, the government? Has he uh, pilfered from the poor to give to the rich? What is it that he has done? Well, the scriptures tell us what he did. In Acts chapter 10, Here's what we read in verse 38. God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. He went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. He went about doing good. That's all that Jesus ever did. He only did what was good. He only did what was right. He never did anything wrong. Nothing, certainly nothing that warranted stoning him or killing him. He only did what was right. It reminds us of what we're going to read about in the upper room. In John chapter 15, Jesus uh, said this in verses 24 and 25. He said this, If I had not done among them the works that no one else did, they would not be guilty of sin. But now they have se both seen and hated me and my Father. But the word that is written in their law must be fulfilled. They hated me without cause. They had no cause to hate Jesus, and yet they did. And so here he is saying, I did all these works, yet they still hate me. Let's turn to the works. He says to them here, I have shown you many good works. Notice what he says, from the Father. These aren't merely the works of Jesus these are the works of Jesus that was given to him from the Father, from his power and by his power. He says, for which one of them are you going to stone me? What works had Jesus done to this point? Well, in the Gospels, we have over 40 miracles that Jesus did that defy human logic or scientific reason. 
40 miracles that are beyond comprehension, that are not natural. And those are only the ones we have recorded for us. Look at what John says in John chapter 20. At the end of John's gospel, or near the end of John's gospel, in chapter 20, 30 and 31, we have this. Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. He did many other signs. We sang the love of God just now. Could, if, the, if the ocean were filled with ink and the skies were parchment and every person in the world was a scribe, you still couldn't write all of the love of God. And so it is with all of his works and miracles. In these three years, he did more signs and wonders than you could ever possibly record. But these are recorded that you may believe. Well, these folks here had seen so many of his works. What had they seen to this point? Well, the healing of the sick. Giving of the sight to the, to the blind. Not only those who had become blind over time, but in John chapter 9, he healed a man who was born, born blind. Blind from birth. He calmed the storms in a moment. And they were still. He walked on the water. And as we're going to see in the next chapter, which will be his greatest miracle to date, he raised the dead. They were witness to his miracles over and over. This was essentially the father's stamp of approval upon the son. Because remember, what the man born blind in John 9, remember, what did he say about Jesus? If Jesus did this of his own, if he was working on his own, he couldn't do anything. This is only because the father is with him. Look at what the man born blind said in John 9, 32. Never since the world began has it been heard that anyone opened the eyes of a man born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. He's right. The man born blind was right. This work is a testimony of who Jesus is. It's a statement to everyone watching that Jesus is God, but they couldn't see it. Jesus is in agreement with them. He's in agreement with the blind man. He quotes scripture to prove it. Now, if you are in a small group, you probably wrestled with the scripture that he quoted. Psalm 82, verse 6 is what he quotes, which is why Don read Psalm 82 for us earlier. This is in verse 34 of, of his text here in John 10. Jesus answered them, Is it not written in your law, I said, You are gods? If you called them gods, to whom the word of God came, And scripture cannot be broken. You say of him whom the Father consecrated and sent into the world, you were blaspheming because because I said, I am the Son of God. So what is he meaning here? Well, in Psalm 82, verse 6, we need to understand who's being spoken about here. Time fails us to get too deep into this. But if you just look at the flow of Psalm 82, God has taken his place in the divine council. In the midst of the gods, lowercase g, he holds judgment. And then in our, uh, the text he quotes, or the verse he quotes is verse 6. I said, you are gods, sons of the Most High, all of you. Nevertheless, like men, you shall die and fall like any prince. These are mortal men. They are not God. But they were representatives of God. These are almost certainly administrators, rulers, judges on earth that are meant to represent God to the people. We see this, of course, in Exodus on a few occasions. Let me just take you there just for a moment. Exodus 4, verse 16, here's what we read. As God is uh, telling Moses he needs to go to Pharaoh and speak to Pharaoh. 4, verse 16, it says this, He shall speak to you, pardon me, he shall speak for you, so Aaron's going to speak for you to the people, and he shall be your mouth, and you shall be as God to him. Exodus 7, verse 1. The Lord said to Moses, See, I have made you like God to Pharaoh, and your brother Aaron shall be your prophet. These are rulers who, to whom the word of God came, as Jesus said in John chapter 10, that were meant to represent God. And yet, the rulers meant to represent God went awry so often. And yet, the people here, the Pharisees, they had no problem because it suited their purposes. They say, look, we're like gods. But 
Psalm 82 also says, you who think you're gods, you're going to die like everyone else. You're mortal men. And he says, how is it that you can hold that and Scripture cannot be broken? You hold that to be true. But then when I come along and I testify to you about who I am and I show you who I am with all of my works and it makes it painfully evident that I am the Messiah prophesied from of old, you won't believe that. The evidence is overwhelming. At this point, they had been witness to countless miracles that Jesus had done that made no sense unless he is who he says he is. In in light of the evidence that was before them, they should have received it with gladness and joy. Patrick Glynn is a former arms negotiator in the Reagan administration. His journey to atheism began in grade school when he began to hear about evolution, and it came to full-fledged atheism uh, once he graduated with his doctorate from Harvard in the 1970s. But he married a Christian. Now, I'm going to just pause here. This is an aside for free. If you are a teenager here, a young person here, who is not yet married, Stephen Bray is one of the missionaries we support, and he often says this, do not make the exception to the rule the rule. We're going to read a story here about someone coming to faith who married a Christian and they came to faith. That's the exception to the rule. I urge you, marry someone who loves Jesus, or life is going to be painfully hard for you. But in this case, his Christian spouse would debate with him and would say, no, you need to, you need to believe in Jesus. And so finally he said, forget it. I'm, I'm going to go and research it for myself. And much like um, Josh McDowell, he got to the point after so much study and so much research of saying this, quote, there is no good reason for an intelligent person to embrace the illusion of atheism or agnosticism. There is simply too much scientific evidence to support intelligent design. And so he believed. Praise God. The the evidence led to a logical verdict if you had eyes to see. And in Jesus' case here, he's saying, if you don't believe me, verse 38, believe the works. Look at the proof. Look at the evidence. The evidence shows who I am. All of this is by the power of God. What were the responses? There's two primary responses we see in this text. The first one is blindness. Now remember, brothers and sisters, one of the key themes in the Gospel of John, it's not the only theme, but it's one of the key themes, is this contrast between darkness and light. We have seen it throughout the whole Gospel, starting from chapter 1 on, darkness, light, darkness, light. And we come just before what's led to John 10 and this whole discourse is what happened in John 9. What happened in John 9 was a man born blind lived his entire life in darkness. And then, by God's grace, he was given sight. He went from darkness to light. Not just physical light, but spiritual light. Look at John chapter 9, verses 35 to 38. Jesus heard that they had cast him out, and having found him, he said, Do you believe in the Son of Man? He answered, and who is he, sir, that I may believe in him? Jesus said to him, you have seen him, and it is he who speaks to you. Or who is speaking to you, pardon me. He said, Lord, I believe, and he worshipped him. He went from physical darkness to physical light, and from spiritual darkness to spiritual light. Praise God. But the next verse is right after that. We have Pharisees, John 9, 40 and 41. And they said, are we also blind? What are you saying about us? The Coles Notes version, yes. You're blind. Oh, you think you can see. You're supposed to be spiritual leaders. You're supposed to be spiritually enlightened, but you're blind as a bat. And here we have, in John chapter 10, Jesus presenting the evidence before them to say, listen, look at all of my works. And they are blind to see it. In fact, every time Jesus makes a claim to deity, Throughout the Gospel of John, we have people trying to kill him. As opposed to looking at the evidence 
examining it, considering it in light of the Old Testament, the Bible they would have had in their, at their disposal. No, they simply try to snuff out the evidence. John chapter 5, we read about that. If, we, if you've been with us through our series, John 5, 16 to 18. This is why the Jews were persecuting Jesus, because he was doing these things on the Sabbath. But Jesus answered them, My Father is working until now, and I am working. This is why the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him. Because not only was he breaking the Sabbath, he was calling God his own Father, making himself equal with God. In John chapter 8, we, we, ha- we just came through that recently, where Jesus said, before Abraham was, I am. He's calling himself the God that spoke to Moses in the burning bush, the great I am from Exodus 3. And what did they try to do? They tried to kill him immediately, John eight fifty nine. And here they're trying to kill him again. And listen, the evidence did not make them apathetic. It didn't make them indifferent. They were never, you don't hear them ever saying, well, he's not claiming to be God. You hear that a lot today. Jesus never claimed to be God. Well, they sure thought he was. Every time he made a claim to deity, they tried to kill him because that's what you do. Leviticus 24, 16, if anyone blasphemes, you stone him. And what do they say? You're blaspheming. That's what he says in the text. You're bla- Look what they say. It's not for a good work that we're going to stone you, because, but for blasphemy, because you being a man, notice their statement there, you being a man, make yourself God. In other words, you are a man, you are not God, but you're claiming to be God. That was their notion, and thus they were trying to kill him and stone him even with the evidence staring them right in the face. We will kill you even though everything about you screams Messiah. But no, we'll just kill you. They had a thirst for death. They were, as Matthew 15 tells us, blind guides, leading the blind to death. And it tells us something else. Unless the Lord of glory opens the eyes of the heart, just like he did with this man born blind in John chapter 9, unless the Lord does that, mankind will not naturally see. There's nothing in their nature that will bring them to a place of seeing Jesus for who he is. We will be like those listed in Ephesians 2, 1 to 3. If you're not sure what Ephesians 2, 1 to 3 says, here's what it reads. You were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once live in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the, and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. These people in John chapter 10 had every evidence about who Jesus was right in front of them, and they were blind and hard of heart in their darkness. Now, we can present all of the apologetic facts about Jesus to the lost that we can, and we should. You hear me? Faith comes from hearing. So, and hearing from the Word of God. We should be active and more active than anyone in the world about bringing the message of the good news of Jesus to the lost, presenting all the evidence we can. Yes and amen. But know this, you could present every ounce of evidence beyond the shadow of a doubt to an unbelieving person. Unless the Lord opens their eyes, they won't see it. Thomas Huxley was a famous agnostic, and he was once confronted by a very sincere Christian. The Christian had a very polite conversation with him, and he said, I'm not trying to impugn your sincerity. But he went on to say this, might it be possible that you, the great scientist, have a, have a version of color blindness? That is to say, some people cannot see traces of green, where other people cannot help but see it. Could this be Huxley, Huxley's problem, that, that it was simply a matter of blindness, that he couldn't see what was plain to everyone else? And Oliver Huxley admitted that this was possible, and, but then he added, that if it was possible, if it was true, him being blind, he would never be able to recognize that for what it is. It's true. 
He's not wrong. It will take the Lord to open the eyes of any heart before they'll believe. Salvation is not in my hands or your hands. Salvation is in the hands of the Lord. And if he didn't open the eyes of the heart, none of us would be saved. But the fact that there are believers sitting here today, I look around this room and I see a lot of beloved believers here. People I love. And I know the Lord has done a miracle in your heart. Which also, by the way, leads me to this aside. Here's another one for free. I can't tell you how many people I talk to when they're going to be baptized or become a member. And we always say, well, we want you to share your testimony in church. And they're They tremble at that, right, because it's the number one fear of man, more even than dying, is to speak in public. And they'll often say to me, well, I have a boring testimony. I grew up in a Christian home. I can't even remember when I came to faith in Christ. I just always believed uh, as far back as I can remember. And and, uh, I didn't really ever rebel. And I just, you know, I've just kind of been growing in my faith. But, you know, there's nothing, you know, there's, it's not exciting. You don't understand the gospel. You, whether you believe it or not, you were dead in your transgressions. And God made you alive. He resurrected you. Every uh, testimony of salvation is a miracle. Every one. Whether you were a drug addict in the ghetto or whether you grew up in a conservative Mennonite home like I did. Every testimony of God's grace is a miracle. It should be shouted from the rooftops. God has done a work. He's opened my eyes. I was blind, but now I see. But these guys were blind, and they remain blind. But there is one other testimony given in this text. There's a testimony of blindness from these men. But then there's also the testimony of sight. Look at verses 40. 42. It says there that he went away again across the Jordan to the place where John had been baptizing. So that is, if you go back to the start of of John's gospel, John was baptizing at Bethany. There's two Bethanies in the Bible. The Bethany we're going to see next week. and There's the Bethany where Jesus is going to now. The Bethany on the other side of of the Jordan, the other side of the tracks. It's like going to Turner Valley, whatever. <laughs> I can't make that joke much more. I've got about two and a half months left, and then it's all Diamond Valley. But. but he goes to the other side of the Jordan. This is where John, it says, has been baptizing, where John the Baptist did the bulk of his ministry. And upon realizing that he had made his way to the region, look at what we read. Many came to him, verse 41. This is a common theme we also see in the Gospels. When Je- wherever Jesus was, there was a crowd of people. Many wanted to be with him. They wanted to be around him. And who, who can blame them? But what do they say? John did no sign. That's right, he didn't. But everything that John said about this man was true. What did John say about this man? There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to bear witness about the light that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but he came to bear witness about the light. John would go on to say, Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. He would go on to say, This is the Son of God. This was the testimony of John the Baptist. And now here he is in their midst. And this is a region where they likely would have heard to some degree about some of the miracles Jesus had done. Some of them may have been present when when Jesus had done some amazing signs. But they likely, almost certainly, did not have access to the signs and wonders that the Jews did in Jerusalem. They wouldn't have seen all the many miracles Jesus would have done there. And yet, what do we read? John did no sign, but everything that John said about this man was true. And they said, let's let's study this further before before we go too far. Is that what the text says? Many believed in him there. It made way more sense for the Pharisees, for the Jews 
in the first part of the, our text to believe in Jesus. They had more evidence than we could possibly imagine in front of them, and yet they would not believe. These people who had heard the testimony of John the Baptist, which reminds us, keep testifying about Jesus to everyone. You never know when the Lord might make that all click in his timing, in his way, opening the eyes of the heart through, in part, your testimony. But they'd heard about him from John the Baptist, and now they believe. Why is it that they believed? They believed because Jesus opened their eyes. When the Lord opens the eyes, people will believe. That is what the scriptures tell us. Go with me, if you will, to Luke 24. Luke 24, verses 44 to 47. Listen to what we read. And he said to them, there, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the Scriptures and said to them, Thus it is written, the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead and that repentance for the forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. And he goes on from there. He opened their minds so that they could now understand. And until he opened their minds to understand, they wouldn't. They couldn't. But once he opened their minds to understand, they, they believed. They understood. Acts chapter 16, we have the testimony of Lydia. In verses 14 and 15, listen to what we read here. One who heard us was a woman named Lydia from the city of Thyatira, a seller of purple goods who was a worshiper of God. The Lord opened her heart to pay attention to what was said by Paul. And after she was baptized, and her household as well, she urged us to stay, and they did. But the Lord opened her heart to believe, and she did. This is the work of God. This is what God does. He opens blind eyes. There are many, many, many who will remain in their blindness. By God's grace, there are many who have had their eyes open. Some of you are sitting here today. This is essentially the end here in John chapter 10. This is the end of, or, or, yeah, the end of his formal public ministry. After this, as we're going to see next week, he begins his march to Jerusalem he begins his march to the cross. His time, we've read up till now, his time has not come, his time has not come, his time has not come. But starting next week, his time has come. And as he ends this public, formal ministry, we're left with this question. The evidence is in front of us. He has given us everything sufficient for us to believe what he says about himself. All the testimonies about the Messiah have been proven by Jesus. Everything that he has done has screamed, I am the Messiah. All the testimonies of the Old Testament have found their proof in him. And the question left to the people of this day as it is for the people of our day, how will you respond? Will you wallow in darkness, or will you come to the light? Now, the Lord oversees that, and yet we are also called to urge people, to plead with people to come to faith in Christ. So hear me pleading today. Imagine for a moment if you had been born blind. I don't know if anyone here, or I can't see anyone here that has that testimony. But imagine for a moment being born blind, never having the capability to see. And then the Lord in a moment, boom, grants you sight. Now I can see perfectly. Imagine for, with me for a moment when you can see, you can see shapes and colors and people's faces and your mom, your dad for the first time, all of these things. And imagine saying, yeah, this is amazing. Pass me that blindfold. I prefer to, to live as a blind person. Would anyone do that? Nobody would do that. Not in the physical realm. In the physical realm, nobody would do that. What about the spiritual realm? You who claim to believe, are you living as a sighted person? Think about those who were freed from Egypt. 
in Exodus, in bondage for 400 years. Slavery. It was wicked. It was tyranny. It was awful. It was dreadful. They were being crushed under Pharaoh's reign. And the Lord provides a deliverer. And the deliverer miraculously leads them out. And they're going to go to the promised land. Between their bondage and the promised land, there is this interim period where things are going to be a little bit tough, but you're, there's the promise of the promised land coming. But in that interim period, when things are a little bit tough, they immediately do what? Oh, we wish we were back there. There, we knew we were getting three square meals. There, we knew what we, you know, it was a known entity to us. Are you kidding me? But how many times don't we see that today? Someone's lived under the bondage of sin all of their life. And by God's grace, he opens their eyes to understand Jesus. And they believe. And heaven awaits. The promised land is coming. But from now until then, Jesus said, in this world, you will have trouble. Take heart. I've overcome the world. But in this world, you've got to have trouble. And at the first sign of trouble, what do so many people who profess Christ do? I wish I was back there. I enjoyed my sin. Galatians chapter 4, Paul is concerned about them for this exact reason. Formerly, when you did not know God, you were enslaved, those that by nature are not gods. But now that you've come to know God, or rather be known by God, how can you turn back again to the weak and worthless, I believe the NIV says the weak and beggarly, Elementary principles of the world, whose slaves you want to be once more. You observe days and months and seasons and years. I'm afraid that, you, that I may have labored over you in vain. If you are someone who was once blind, but now you've been given sight, take the blindfold off. Live as those who have sight. Don't want to go... Don't. Ask, plead with the Lord in your heart, Lord, help me not to love darkness. Help me to long to be in the light. Because by nature, what is the testimony of the Gospels? Men love darkness rather than light. Lord, by your Spirit, would you increasingly help me to love the light, to walk in the light, to live in the light, to be a people of the light, that we would not go back to our blindness and hardness of heart. Help us not to be like these Pharisees who see the evidence and just stay stone cold. Perhaps there are those here this morning or watching online that have, have no relationship with Jesus Christ. You are like these Pharisees. The evidence is before you. And let me tell you, the evidence is before you. If you're here and you don't know the Lord, if you're watching and you don't know the Lord, so that you don't leave here saying, well, I didn't actually, what, what is this good news? Let me tell you what the good news is. Starts with bad news. Well, actually, you know, starts with good news, then it goes to bad news, and then back to good news. Good news. God created the heavens and the earth. And he did it, and when he made it, it was perfect. And he created animals, and he created you know, stars in the sky, and trees and rivers, and created Adam and Eve. And at the end of six days, he looked at all that he made, and he said, what? It is very good. Good news. He said, be fruitful and multiply. That's good news. Otherwise, you wouldn't be sitting here. Someone had to be fruitful and multiply. So good news. Genesis 3 comes, and that's where the bad news is introduced. Man is fallen into sin. Rebel against God. Shaking their fist at God. And because of that, Romans 5 tells us that all have sinned. It's passed down through all of us. All, are, all of us are sinful by nature and by choice. All have sinned, Romans 3 tells us, and have fallen short of the glory of God. All of us. There is not a person in this room who does not have sin. In fact, I dare say there's probably not a person in this room who hasn't sinned today. All of us have sinned. And thus, all of us deserve eternal damnation, and there's not a single thing you can do by your own effort to save yourself. 
can't be done. I don't care how many days you go to church. I don't care how much money you give to charity. I don't care how many little old ladies you help across the street. You can't save yourself because you're a sinner. You have fallen short of God's glory. Bad news. Here's the good news. God saw from eternity past, the plan was in place, Ephesians 1 tells us, that the Son of God would come. His name is Jesus. That he would live the perfect life that you and I failed to meet. And he would die the death that you and I deserve to die. That he would bear my sin upon himself, which he did. He was nailed to a tree, recorded both in the scriptures and, and extra biblical evidence. He was laid in Joseph of Arimathea's tomb. He rose bodily from the grave three days later. Was seen by over 500 witnesses, most of whom were alive when this was written. That they could be validated and verified and proven that, yes, Jesus was in fact seen alive. Post-death, post-burial, alive. All of the testimonies are true. First-hand witnesses, Peter and John, they wrote about it. Eyewitnesses who gave up their life for this testimony. If, if you have a lie and you're going to concoct a lie and you're going to try to dupe the whole world and you know full well it's a lie, guess what you're not going to do? You're not going to die for it. If you know full well it's a lie, you won't die for it. The only way you're dying for something is if you believe it to be true. John, Peter, the disciples, they were willing to die. The testimony that Jesus Christ died, was buried, and rose again. He ascended. The disciples were there. They gave evidence of that. And he has promised to come and claim his people, the church, to bring them to himself for all eternity. All of those who turn from blindness to sight. Who, who turn from their sin and turn to Jesus. That is repentance. Leaving all of my sinfulness behind and holding fast to Jesus Christ. Oh, that you would do that. Oh, that today you would go from being a Pharisee to being one of those on the other side of the Jordan. You might believe and hold to the testimony of Jesus Christ. I urge you today, for those of us who have done that, praise God, don't take that for granted. Let the testimony of our life be those who live in the light. Those who live by, by faith and not by sight because we have sight. Because of our sight, we live by faith, not by sight. You understand what I mean by that? If you don't talk to me later or talk to Bryce. Um, live by sight in this dark world. And may that be the testimony of God's rich blessing to your life that would draw some consider Christ. So Father, I pray that you'd give us that testimony, that we as a church would arise and put our armor on and live valiantly in this world for the glory of God. That we, Lord, would not shrink back from declaring your goodness, but that we would be bold and courageous, not just with our lips, but with the very testimony of our life. Behind closed doors, may we be men and women of integrity living for the glory of God. And, and Father, I pray if there be those who don't know you by faith, that by your Spirit you would quicken them even now. That you would bring them out of death and into life. Out of darkness and into light. Out of blindness and into sight. So Father, might you do a continuous work in us to your glory. We thank you for the evidence that is before us that demands a verdict. May we hold fast to that which we know is true. And not believe a world of lies around us. Pray these things in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Stand as we close in song.